All right, and we're live. We're live. Hey, welcome to another Bible study at Basil Creek Missionary Baptist Church in the beautiful city of Fuquay, Verena. Welcome all of you all who are joining us live on Facebook and all of you all that are joining us on the conference call line. So thankful that God has brought us to Wednesday, the middle of the week. What a glorious day we had last Sunday as we celebrated the 154th uh, anniversary of Basil Creek. We're so thankful that God has brought you all this far and what God is going to do and continually do in the future. Uh, just know that, you know, what we're doing, the mission that we're on. Um, so we're just uh, here to to let you know that, that God is faithful and that God has continually blessed us over the years and will continually do so. We want to get into the word tonight, but before we get in the word, I want to open up with a word of prayer uh, to help guide our spirits and our minds as we absorb the word of God, as we break the bread of life together and consume the wisdom and the revelatory knowledge of God. Pray with me, beloved. God, we thank you for this uh, teaching moment right now, God. I thank you for every single person that is under the sound of my voice. God, as we journey through the scriptures together, allow us to comprehend God, allow the Holy Spirit to give us clarity of mind and of thought, open up our wisdom portals that we might absorb your word, God, and that it might be sunk deep in our hearts, that we might germinate a harvest to bring forth your will and your kingdom here on earth. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you all are ready to do some Bible study? Yes. So, you know, last week, let's do a quick recap. Last week, we talked about uh, revealed love, right? Revealed love and how, uh, you know, Joseph, as he was um, revealing his true identity to his brothers, became overwhelmed with emotion. And in that moment, he was able to forgive his brothers for the heinous acts they did to him by beating him up throwing him into a well and selling him off, right? And then lying to their father about his death. But Joseph was able to overlook all of that. He did not take revenge on his brothers. What did he do? He decided to move with compassion, empathy, and most importantly, forgiveness. And he was able to bless his family and to uh, to go ahead and set the family on their destiny to, be, to take over the promised land of Canaan. So today we want to journey to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 19, continuing on the same vein of love. But tonight we're going to talk about a love that intercedes. I want you to think about that for a minute. A love that intercedes. And we'll be coming from 1 Samuel chapter 19. All right. And it reads like this. I'm not going to read all of the verses because you all... You should have your, your study tools, but if you don't, we'll put it in the feed, uh, you know, the, the Bible verses so you can co go back and review this at a later time. But because we have such limited time together, we're just going to highlight some of the key verses here. First uh, Samuel 19, verse one, and it reads, and Saul spake to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants that they should not kill, that they should kill David. All right, I'm going to read that one more time. And Saul spake to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants that they should kill David. Verse two, but Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father, seeketh to kill thee. Now, therefore, I pray thee that take heed to thyself until the morning and abide in a secret place. Hmm. And hide thyself. Uh, verse three. And I will go out and I will stand beside my father in the field where thou art. And I will commune with my father of thee. And what I see that will tell thee. Right. And I want you to give you this key verse here is verse four. Our key verse is Jonathan spake good of David unto Saul, his father, and said unto him, let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he hath not sinned against thee, and because his works have been to thee word very good. All right. So we're going to be talking about a love that intercedes. Let's take a moment and check in with some folks here. Who do we got on the line here? I see you, Marcia Patterson. Thank you for joining us tonight. I see you, Tamara. Uh, thank you for joining us. I see you, Tracy. I see you, Whitney. Thank you all for uh, uh, joining in. Remember, let's try and keep this conversational if we can. I will do my best 
to uh to check in with you on the live stream on the feed here uh questions comments suggestions let's keep it um you know conversational even though we're separated by distance right now we cannot be in each other's physical presence we still can communicate with each other and let's do that as a family because that's what we are right we're a creek family hey miss Faye, i see you thank you for joining us tonight so and the love that intercedes let's start with the working definition of love right now we're not just talking about you know the, the your average everyday word uh love that word gets used so many times right we love everything we love food we love materials you know we love our job we love experiences uh you know we love our pets all these times we use this word love and that's true we do have a very deep uh emotion of admiration of of care for things, people, and places, right? But this love that we're talking about here, it only comes from what? Above. This is that agape love, that all-encompassing love, that unconditional love. As a matter of fact, did you know that the word agape doesn't really have an English word to describe it? It takes multiple words to describe this love because that's how divine it is. And in order to have a love that intercedes on behalf of others, we have to get that love from God. So it's a couple things I want to highlight here uh, um, in, the, in the text. One, give you a little back uh, backstory on our text tonight. Um, in in this text, we're finding that the friends, Jonathan, who was the king's son, right, is interceding on behalf of his friend, soon to be King David, right? So, uh, you know the backstory. If you don't know the backstory, Saul, for whatever his reasons were, became jealous of David. I think one of the crescendos of his jealousy was when they were coming back from battle and the people were singing a song and they gave more accolade and credit to David than they did to Saul. And Saul got extremely extremely envious and jealous of that and then sought from that time forward to take David out but his friend his best friend right uh was uh Jonathan and Jonathan was Saul's son and Jonathan did not want to see David hurt he did not want to see his father do this hard thing remember the key verse it says Jonathan spake good of David unto his father right so he did not want to see David harmed uh, he literally interceded on behalf of David now point number one that we're going to make before we journey a little bit further in this text is why would Jonathan put his own safety and his own relationship with his dad in jeopardy just to save his best friend. I want to propose to you that number one would be empathy. You know what empathy means? Empathy means that I know something about what you're going through. It's not sympathy. Remember, I feel bad for you. It's not just compassion. I'll stay here with you while you suffer. Empathy means I know something about what you're going through. Now, what could Jonathan have known that David was going through at this point in time? Well, I'm going to take you back about five chapters. Five chapters earlier, guess whose head was on the chopping block? Jonathan's. His dad wanted to kill him. Saul wanted to kill Jonathan because Jonathan had made a mistake and had broke this vow. They had made a vow that they weren't going to eat. Jonathan found some honey or something like that and then put it to his lips. And Saul was like, you know what? Whoever it was that broke this covenant we had, whoever it was, even if it's my son, I'm going to kill him. And even when he found out it was Jonathan, uh, you know, Jonathan was like, do I have to die for tasting some honey? And, and Saul was like, yeah, you're going to die, bro. You know, but thanks be to God that the other people in the camp and in the army spoke up for Jonathan. And said, don't do this, king. It's almost verbatim. They literally spoke good of Jonathan unto Saul, his father, and convinced him not to kill Jonathan. So fast forward five chapters. We're in chapter 19, and Saul is back at it again, ready to kill somebody, right? Ready to kill somebody and snuff their life out because of his own misgivings and his own hardened heart. But that's the first thing, empathy. Jonathan knew about that fear. Hey, thank you, Pastor Allen. What's up, my friend? I see you. Jonathan knew about that fear. He knew about that 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 wrongful conviction and 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 being uh, uh, placed in a position 
that was detrimental to his health and uh, and also, you know, not having an advocate and, and having people step up and, and put their own safety at risk. Jonathan knew that. So literally in chapter 19, what is he doing? He's paying it for. And how is he paying it for? With empathy. His heart, his love for David is saying, I know what that's like, David, and I don't want that to happen to me, and I don't want it to happen to anybody else. Number two. Uh, we learned that how this is, how the two were unified, how the love they had between them unified them or reconciled. So what does love do? Love unifies and reconciles. In one previous chapter, in chapter 18, uh, it talks about how David and Jonathan were of one spirit. Did you hear what I said? They had uh, one spirit. It was, they were one together. Right? And when you are really moving and operating in agape love, a love that intercedes on the behalf of others, when you're doing that, you are one with that other person, just like Jesus, just like Jesus. You know what Jesus is? Jesus is sitting, seated on the right hand of the Father, and what is Jesus doing? interceding for us day and night and 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 and, and sitting there making uh intercessions for us making groanings for us when we cannot muster the words or we don't have an eloquent prayer jesus is there he is the great intercessor for us because what he loves us and the third thing is love that foresees in first samuel chapter 23 i hope we get there i hope we get there you'll see what the outcome of this reconciliatory intercessory love is you'll see because in um first samuel chapter 23 jonathan prophesies to david he prophesies and say hey look bro i know you're going to be king of israel right don't mind my father. My father's tripping right now, right? But I see because I'm able to see clearly through all the stuff that was going around, all of the uh, the, the melee and the, uh, the, the, the wars and the family dysfunction that was going around. Jonathan's love for David allowed him to see through that. And he could see the he could see the mission. He could see the destiny and purpose that God had for David. And he prophesied to David in First uh, uh, Samuel chapter twenty three. And he says, "Look, I see where God is going to take you. Don't worry about my dad. I'm going I'm going to take care of that for you." Okay. So those three things: empathy, uh, intercessory love, does what it empathizes, it unifies and reconciles, and it foresees or either. For gives. Let's keep journeying through the text here. There's some lesson aims I want you to take away from this. And remember, um, go ahead and put something in the text. I thank you, uh, Marcia, for uploading the um the points there. Uh, I encourage each of you all that are watching, that are listening, go ahead and upload your questions, your comments, and let's keep this conversational. Conversational. Even if you have a prayer request, we want to hear about that also. So the lesson aims tonight. After participating in this lesson, what should each of the hearers at least be able to address? Um, one should be able to summarize Jonathan's defense of David and Saul's reaction. Right. Number two, explain the risk Jonathan faced in the reconciliation process. And number three, identify opportunities to counsel reconciliation and to do so. So I have a question for you. You know, I have a question for you. And I want you to ask yourself this. Are you someone who is a lover of peace, right? Or are you someone who just avoids conflict? Think about that really quick. Do you really love peace? Are you an advocate for peace? Are you a proponent for peace or you're just someone who avoids hard conversations, discomfortable, uh, uncomfortable situation uh, and conflict? Let me tell you something. In order to have agape love, agape love will lead you into conflict. It will conflict you physically. It will conflict you emotionally and definitely spiritually. Trust and believe Jesus was conflicted when he <laughs> entered into the garden of Gethsemane the night before he was crucified. Trust and believe he was conflicted, you know, when uh, he entered into the temple and saw people using his uh, father's house of prayer as a temple to make money. Trust and believe he was conflicted 
afflicted all the times when when people would come to him and ask him for things and, and challenge him in the streets. He was conflicted, but because of his unconditional love, because of that John 3, 16, that unconditional agape love, he was able to what? Empathize. He was able to forgive and he was able to foresee. All right. So so we want to make sure that we get the, the context here that because you love and because you have intercessory love or are seeking to be an intercessor in love does not mean that you will not have conflict. Trust that Jonathan was conflicted to talk to his dad, especially since five chapters earlier, he was the one who was, uh, whose life was threatened by his own father. Now, I don't know about you, but if my dad threatened my life, I'm not trying to talk to him no more, right? <laughs> but Jonathan risked all of that because of this love, this unconditional love he had for his uh, friend, um, David. So we want to make sure you get that part right, right? So ask yourself, what do you think it would cost you to really live into unconditional love? Like, where do you think unconditional love would, would, would take you? I want to read a little bit here from our text here. It says, uh, peacemakers sometime come to a very violent end, right? A very violent end. Think about all the people who we esteem high in, um, in our society. Think about Martin Luther King. Think about uh, Gandhi. Think about Malcolm X. Think about Medgar Evers. Think about Rosa Parks, you know, and all these uh, people who have helped us. Uh, think about John Lewis, you know, um, and all these, these great uh, advocates of peace and justice that we have seen um, come before us. So, I heard someone say that when you um, push against the wall of oppression, right? When you push against the wall of oppression, when peacemakers, when uh, lovers of peace push against this wall of hatred, oppression, and prejudice, they will get it to crumble, but it will fall down on top of them first. What does that mean? That means that operating in intercessory love is risky, but so much worth it. Remember, we're going to get to what the outcome of this intercessory love that Jonathan had for David in just a moment. So let me uh, read some comments here. Let's see. We got uh, someone say, what up, Pastor? What up? I see. You. Thank you for that. Um, so lesson uh, is in this is to learn how to see People and things and situations, how God sees them through a loving scope, through a loving eye. But the truth is we get offended. We get offended easily. And if we go back to our um, our text here, which is our devotional reading, our devotional reading comes from Matthew chapter five. And Matthew chapter five tells us something. here. It tells us that we should forgive. And it says, I'm, I'm going to read it for you. It says Matthew chapter five, verses 43 through 48. Listen to this divine definition of forgiveness and love. All right. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor. All right. And you hate and hate your enemy. That seems pretty, pretty uh, cut and dry. But I tell you, this is Jesus speaking. It says, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. All right. Uh, OK, I get it. It's, uh, it's like one of those Christian fundamentals. But how many of us really can love someone who hates us? How many of us can love someone going a step further who has persecuted us? And I'm not just talking about spreading rumors about you around the cubicles, right? And around the water fountain. I'm talking about someone who has done uh, indelible harm to you. Someone who has literally harmed you. Let's read real quick with uh, what Marisa says. She says, love is powerful when it comes from that place where we can forgive, giving people forgiveness before they ask for it or even if they don't you don't think they deserve it so verse 45 in matthew chapter 5 it says that you may be children of god in heaven look at the prerequisite for what it takes to use intercessory revealing love but i tell you love your enemies and love those who persecute you that you may be children of your father in heaven. 
Now, I love this. I love the second part of this verse. I want you to get this. Are you are you listening? Are you listening? If you haven't, go ahead and hit share. Go ahead and hit share. If you haven't already, gather everyone in. I want you to get this, beloved. This is so cool. Look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. The second part of that says, he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. I'm going to say that one more time. He causes his son, S-U-N to rise on the evil and the good. Did you hear that? I love that play there because the sun rises on people, whether you're loving, whether you're hating or not. But Jesus was sent to this world, the son of God. It says that, you know, for God, what? So love the world, not just so God so love Fuquay Verena, God so love Wake County, God so love North Carolina, God so loved America, God so loved the Western hemisphere. No, God so loved the world and it gave no time frame. Did you hear they didn't say God so loved the world? from zero uh, AD until 2020. It says, so God so loved the world. That means from the foundation of creation, without time, without space, without limitation, God's love has been here for the world. That he did what? That he sent his son to rise. Oh my God. That means that the salvific work of the cross, that intercessory love of God is irresistible, undeniable, and prevenient, which means it has been working on your behalf before you were even formed in the belly of your mother. So I love that scripture. I love that uh, devotional scripture. Read it in your leisure. Matthew chapter five, verses 43 through 48. Back to our story. So we find Jonathan here interceding and putting his life at risk, uh, experiencing conflict with his father and, and, and doing this because he loves his friend and he knows something about his life being in danger because he is using his empathy. Remember from the five chapters earlier. So the plot of this is that an execution order was given. Let me tell you something what happens when a king gives an edict, right? It's not just a suggestion. Right? It's not like, yeah, I think you ought to do this or when you feel like it, when you get ready, do this. No, when a king says something, it is literally the current law of the land. So when Samuel, uh, when, um, when Samuel uh, uh, picked Saul to be the king, uh, when Saul rose up through that kingship, when he took his kingship, that literally meant that whatever Saul said, even if he was out of his mind or, uh, you know, morally compromised was the law of the land. So when Saul spake to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants that David should die, that wasn't a suggestion. That wasn't, if you agree with me, that wasn't go get him a defense attorney. That wasn't, let's go have a, a trial. Let's go let him sit on death row for a while. That was the law of the land and it better happen right now. Checking back in with you. Let's read. He said, God is love. He loves everyone as we we should do the same. Sometimes it's tough. I'll say it is tough. That's why it takes divine love to be an intercessory lover, right? So when the king issues an edict, you better do what the king says, or you're going to find yourself on the same end of that sword that the king has ordered for David. So Jonathan was risking a lot, right? He was risking a lot. And I have another question for you, beloved. What is your love for God causing you to risk? Hmm, what are we risking? Or have we become, you know, uh, modern day uh, believers where everything is supposed to be comfortable, everything is supposed to uh, happen in an instant and in a moment, there should be no discomfort, you know, there should be no conflict. No, let me tell you, the first century Christians were persecuted. They were persecuted. They were put in, in, um, in, in arenas and torn apart and and uh, executed uh, in front of uh, hundreds, if not thousands of people. They experienced a lot. And even until today, that believers are experiencing persecution in the world and throughout the land. So what uh, what is the love that you have for God causing you to risk? What does it cost you? It should be it should be a cost to it. Now, we know that grace is unmerited, which means that God gives it and that we can't afford it. And even if we could, we wouldn't know where to purchase it. Right. So grace is unmerited. God gives it to us freely and willingly. Right. But still, our, our response to that grace that what is it costing us? Diedrich Bonhoeffer would say it should uh, not be cheap grace. 
right? It should not be just, you should always be comfortable. Sometimes because we are operating in divine love, it is going to thrust us into places and situations that are going to bring on conflict. But when we trust that we are standing on the rock, when we trust the one who has sent us, when we trust in the love that is the sole reason we are there, then we will prevail. So the order was given to kill David. It wasn't a suggestion. It was an edict and it better happen. And in that moment, Jonathan raises up that agape love, that intercessory love raises Jonathan up and he speaks on David's behalf. And what does he do? He caters to Saul's uh, better nature. He said, do not you know, have his work. Do not, king, do not let your work be against his servant. Let not the king sin. Now, remember, Saul was scared of sin. <laughs> he was scared of sin. Uh, that That's one of the reasons he wanted to kill Jonathan, because they had already consecrated themselves and, you know, to, 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 to God, and he did not want to break that covenant. So he said, don't let this sin. He literally caused it a sin to kill David. And that is catering to the spirit in Saul. Hopefully that Saul has some little corner of his heart left that is not hardened and he can hear this. That's what love can do. Love can soften even the hardest of hearts. Look back at the key verse again. It says, because he hath not sinned against thee. So he's saying, what is this about, Pop? What is this about? You want to kill this guy, right? Because what? Because you're jealous? You know, that's a sin. You shouldn't be jealous of David. You're the king. It sounds like Saul was having his own identity crisis and was projecting those feelings of incompetence and self-doubt onto David as like a Paschal lamb, you know, like uh, uh, someone to blame for his own misdealings and inner feelings of inadequacy, pl uh, placing that on to David. And because his works... Have thee been wayward, uh, thee, thee word, very good. David helped, you know, uh, promote Saul. One of the reasons why Israel was being so successful in their military campaigns is because of David's uh, military skill, but also David's loyalty. Let's see what Tracy wrote. Sometimes it's hard to love your neighbor. Oh, indeed. And then you have to find out who your neighbor is. We like to think of our neighbors as people who live in our neighborhood or right beside us. But I'll expand that. Your neighbor is whoever you have access to. Did you hear that? It's not just about physical proximity, but it's also about spiritual and emotional proximity. And that, you know what? That's a good segue. I, you know, we're almost, uh, almost at time, but I got to get to this part here. This just, it's just so good. Got to get to this part where uh, we find that uh, the, the, the prophecy that Jonathan had given David, he said, I see that you will be king of Israel. I see it. I see it on your life. I know that God is going to do something for you and I'm going to intercede on your behalf for my dad. Right? So, uh, they made a covenant together. Jonathan and David made this covenant. And uh, the covenant was that they will take care of each other no matter what. Mm -hmm. So long story short, Jonathan and his father and brothers go get killed in a battle. And uh, uh, Jonathan had this son. All right. Jonathan had this son named uh, Mephibosheth, chef, Mephibosheth, right? Had this son and the son was crippled. So because there was a, a battle going on and when Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, was five years old, his, his daycare worker or his nurse, whatever you want to call it, was running with him and made a mistake and dropped him and, and, and left him um, crippled, right? So he had this son that was crippled. And uh, in, in 2 Samuel, uh, I think it's chapter 4, that talks about this here. Uh, you also have David that he asked the people, he's like, does Jonathan or is there any remaining person of the house of Saul? Right, that I can honor this covenant, this uh, intercessory um, covenant that was seated by love, that I can honor that. Anyone I can show some love to. So when David became king of Israel, he wanted to honor this covenant that he had with Jonathan. And this is long after Jonathan had been killed. But the love that is timeless, remember we go back to John 3.16, is timeless. 
He didn't say God loved the world in some time period. He said just God loved the world. So this love, this agape intercessory love was timeless. And David wanted to honor this. So when David came to power, he said, is there anyone in Saul's family? Now remember, Saul had done dirty, done him dirty and tried to kill him and tried to kill his friend, uh, Jonathan. But just like our previous lesson that we learned about love, uh, when we learned that Joseph forgave his brothers, David forgave all of that. And he found out that Mephibosheth was, uh, you know, was living somewhere by and he went to go get him and he invited him to live in the royal house with him. Right. And then gave him servants to take care of his whole family just because of this intercessory love that Jonathan initiated in the beginning. Did you hear me? It carried on for generations after that. And, and, and even Mephibosheth was like, what are you doing? Why do you care about me? I'm nothing. He said, no, you are something. Because before you were conceived, you were covered with intercessory love. Oh, my God. How beautiful is that? Isn't it wonderful that people of God, that even before we knew about Jesus, Jesus knew about us. Even before we came into the knowledge of Jesus Christ and accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior, that we were covered. We were covered in the blood that Jesus died for us. He died for entire generations of people that had come before, that they were there now, and that would come into the future. Oh, I'm so glad that we have an intercessor who loves us unconditionally, who offers us agape love that covers a multitude of sin. Thanks be to God that there is charity in the land. And thanks be to God that God has given us the perfect example of love and has given us examples to read in his holy word like Joseph and like Jonathan. Thank you, Jesus, that I don't have to die because of the mistakes that I made, that I don't have to live a life of shame and regret. Thank you, God, for merciful love, for forgiving love, God, for gracious love, for faithful love. Even when I didn't love myself, God is able to love us. Even when it's hard to love those who have persecuted you, God is able to love us. Go back to our devotional scripture. I'm going to finish reading it here, and then I got to get out of here. Remember, post your prayer request if you want. I will respond to you. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 46. Here it says, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are you not even, uh, are not even the tax collectors doing that, right? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? So going back, who is your neighbor? Your neighbor is who you have influence and uh, contact with. What does Wake uh, say? Thank you, Father. Yes, glory, my, uh, Marisa. He says, if you are only loving people who love you back, what reward is that? And uh, verse 48, it says, be perfect. Did you hear that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. Now, is he talking about perfect in uh, in your physical body? No, but perfect love will make you perfect. Intercessory love will make you perfect. Revelatory love will perfect you. You don't have to be without flaw. Jesus took care of all of that. That's why he was the perfect sacrifice for us. And when we offer that love, one, to ourselves and then to our neighbors, then we are being perfected moment by moment hour by hour, day by day, the perfect love of God is going through our bodies and cleansing all of the sin and the shame and the regret and the heartache that we carry so that we might do what? Offer it to someone else. Who is your neighbor? It's time that we start to reevaluate how we're offering love and who we're offering it to. And let me tell you something, beloved, lean in, lean in. I'm going to give you a little secret here. It will bring conflict when you love people perfectly, but you got to learn how to love yourself first. When Jesus was confronted by the Pharisees, they tried to hit him with what my, one of my uh, minister friends, John Roy Lim is called the trickeration. They hit him with the trickeration. They said, out of all the commandments, right? You're supposed to be this rabbi, this teacher, Jesus, out of all the commandments, which one is more important? It was a trick question. 
right? But Jesus and in his infinite wisdom, in his perfect loving self, what did Jesus say? He said to love the Lord thy God with every fiber of your being, with your mind, your body, and your heart. And he said, and the second is just as important as the first, to love your neighbor as yourself. So it's actually three commandments, love God and love yourself so that you can love others. Are you loving yourself today? During a pandemic, are you loving yourself? During all the woes and social ills that are going on in the world, are you loving yourself? How can you love me if you don't love yourself, right? You got to love yourself. And I'm not talking about being conceited. I'm not talking about being selfish. I'm talking about you cannot offer me sweet uh, water out of a bitter well. Did you hear what I said? You can't. Offer me compassion and you don't have compassion for yourself. Forgiveness and you haven't forgiven yourself. That's why it's important to love ourselves. Every time I come encounter with someone who I consider bitter, I don't take it personally at first, right? I'm like, they might not like this stuff. They're having a bad day. Why should I have one too, right? I have to agree. I have to collude in that bitterness, right? But I am too much enjoying the love of God and loving myself. Therefore, I am giving out of overflow overflow. I'm giving love out of the overflow, the abundance. When you, when you recognize how much God loves you, you can't help but love yourself and it can't help but spill out of every orifice in your spirit, right? And catch on to other people. Are you loving yourself? Are you living in the abundant, the revelatory, the intercessory love of God for your life? Well, that's what I got for you tonight. I hope it um, I hope it blessed some people. We're going to keep uh, working through these texts. Remember, next week, uh, we're going to be talking about love for your enemies. Oh, we got a good conversation going on there. I want to see everybody back in... Um uh, back in the place, uh, either on your live streams, on your devices, on your conference call. Meet us here Sunday as we break the bread of life together and we worship uh, and lift up the name of Jesus. I want to see you back here next Wednesday for Bible study. For those of you all who uh, have prayer requests, please go ahead and uh, submit your prayer requests. I will respond to you um, and, and make sure that we are touching and agreeing that God lifts up the desires and the supplications of your heart. Remember, I love you, but more importantly, God loves you more. And whatever you're going through, don't worry about it because God's revelatory, abundant, and intercessory love can cover a multitude. Have a good night.